Good morning, Mike Woods. Thank you for joining us. Can you hear us okay? Yes, I can, Christine. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. All right. I'm going to hand it over to co-chairman, Christina Colon. Welcome, good morning. This is Christina Cologne, your task force co-chair. Thank you all for joining us today. Before we begin, I do want to express our continued concern for the health and safety of you, your family, friends, and communities. The past few months have been a challenging period for our state, the nation, and world, but it has been encouraging to see so many people working together during this time. We know that many of you have personally been dealing with illness in your family, workplace, or community, as well as the impacts of people who are out of work or experiencing other major disruptions. We know that your priorities and schedules have been shifting regularly, so we do greatly appreciate your continued participation in this process. We have appreciated the high level of participation in these webinars, and we particularly enjoyed the thoughtful questions you provided on emerging technology last month. It has been impressive to see how we've all been able to use the virtual format to share our questions and ideas. We've extended the agenda time today to allow for more discussion, as it appears we are learning to be more comfortable in the virtual atmosphere. Our intent is for the discussion in these virtual meetings to become more robust as we figure out the next steps for the future meetings. The look and feel of restoring our face-to-face -face meetings may be a hybrid approach. More to come on that. Our facilitator, Christine Kefauver, will share a few specifics about how today's webinar will work. In general, we want to start thinking about these meetings these virtual meetings as providing the same level of interaction and progress as an in-person meeting. We also have appreciated the participation from members of the public during these webinars. The webinars held in April and May for all three task forces included participation from 1,713 attendees with 129 people providing public comment to the task forces during the designated period. These numbers are well above what we experienced during the in-person task force meetings. This demonstrates how technology can facilitate participation in a meeting by members of the public who may not be able to observe a meeting in person. I also want to thank the many members of the public who provided their comments via email, letters, and other formats. Public input is vital to the process. Public comment during our meetings and webinars is only one way for the public to provide their input. Public comments may be submitted at any time to f.listens.dot.state.fl.us and will become part of the public record. You've received all public comments along with meeting number five materials. We will compile and share all public comments received since February at our meeting set for July. The purpose of today's webinar is to continue our discussion of another important topic, broadband. The MCOR statute envisions multi-use corridors and specifically calls out broadband as well as water, sewer, and energy distribution as opportunities for these corridors. We shared a link of a panel discussion that occurred at the March meeting of the Southwest Central Florida Corridor Task Force with you, but this task force has not 
had an opportunity to discuss this topic as a group. Our experience during the past several weeks has highlighted the importance of broadband and other technologies. So many of us have shifted from working in a traditional office to working remotely and embracing non-traditional ways of interacting virtually. These past several weeks have also shown us where broadband connectivity is limited today. By embracing the vision of multi-use corridors, MCORs can help move us to greater connectivity statewide. We believe that a well-planned multi-use corridor can accelerate broadband deployment and help expand connectivity and services to households, institutions, and businesses. Today's agenda includes a brief presentation followed by a panel discussion on potential opportunities for coordinating broadband deployment and transportation corridor development. Like other expert panels, we want to encourage you to take this time to ask questions and to consider the implications of these broadband opportunities for corridor needs and guiding principles. We'll also have some time for group discussion about guiding principles following the panel. Before I turn it over to Christine, I want to give an update on our work plan. At this point, we don't know when we will be at the phase where we can convene a large in-person group meeting. We intend to abide by the governor's executive order and respect your level of comfort and your organization's guidelines with resuming in-person meetings. That said, we also believe that this task force can continue to make progress, whether we are meeting in person, in virtual meetings, or in a hybrid format. Our focus today and moving ahead remains on how we provide you the data, subject matter experts, and discussion time needed to continue your work on identifying needs and developing guiding principles and instructions for project development and beyond. You'll see more of a focus today on applying what we learn about broadband to shape recommendations for your final report. This progress will continue on other topics at our next webinar later this month and then in our July meeting, which will be held in whatever format is appropriate at that time. Now, I will ask our facilitator, Christine Kefauver, to make a few announcements. Thank you, Christina. Good morning, everyone. It is great that we're able to meet again in this virtual manner. So I'm gonna go over a few uh, topics that we're gonna cover today. Obviously, the public comment period, which is critically important. The logistics of, for the webinar and our, quote, rules of engagement. We'll be using our hand raising today. Today's objective and agenda, an update of the task force work plan, and a brief Florida sunshine reminder. So the public comment begins at 1130 this morning, or as soon as we're done with the task force member discussion. Requests to comment were, were received by 5 o'clock yesterday and will be addressed during the public comment period and the order in which they were received. For those of you speaking in public comment, when your name is called, we will unmute your line to provide comment within an allotted time of three minutes. Only one person at a time will be unmuted. So if you've self-muted, please be sure to unmute before speaking. If you did not submit your request in time to be able to speak today, please email your comments to fdot.listens at dot.state.fl.us. This webinar is being recorded and will be available with other materials on the MCORS website. You will remain muted for the presentations, basically what I'm covering now and all the way through Will's presentation. And once we get into the panel discussion and task force member discussion, we will shift to a more interactive uh, discussion. So in prior webinars, we ran through the entire list of task force members in order to unmute everyone one by one. Today's different. Our discussion will be more like an in-person meeting. So instead of putting up your tent card to indicate you would like to ask a question or make a comment, you will use the raise hands feature. 
We will ask you to remain self-muted when not speaking to reduce the background noise as we will be muting, uh, unmuting everyone. I will recognize people in the order in which they raise their hand, although as we often do in an in-person meeting, I may manage the flow at time to allow members to have, who have not had an opportunity to make a comment to speak or to wrap up a thread of conversation before we move on to another. Please bear with me as this is a shift in format. So I wanna make sure the members of the public who are online and recognize that this raise hand feature is for task force members only. Public comment will be held later in the meeting. If you have self-muted, please be sure to unmute before speaking. A quick remember, reminder, please do not put the webinar on hold or take another call as we may hear your hold music. And one last note, we may have adjusted your username to readily identify you as a task force member or when we need to unmute your line. Please do not make any changes to that username so that you may be heard during roll call and the Q&A period. So, the objectives for today. We want to receive a briefing on opportunities for coordination of broadband deployment with corridor development. We'd like to obtain task force member input on implications of high level needs and guiding principles. And we will receive public comment. So, here's our agenda 9 35. Well, we're a little behind that. We're doing introductions, agenda review, and roll call. Then we'll run through. Um, the panel discussion, then we'll have presentation from Will Watts on broadband deployment opportunities, followed by that panel discussion with our subject matter experts. Then we'll have some time to talk as a group about the implication of these opportunities for needs, guiding principles, and implementation. We'll then touch base on next steps and turn to public comments. The public comment period is scheduled to begin at 11.30 or as soon as our agenda is complete and is expected to take about an hour. We hope that all task force members will be able to stay online. So before we get started, I want to take a minute to review the few refinements to the task force work plan. We have clarified the key products that will be developed by the task force as shown on the slide and documented in the task force work plan work plan and engagement plan. Both documents were recently updated and are posted on the task force website. There are three major components of your recommendations. They're listed here, plus the final report. We will be focusing on the remaining webinars on pro producing these specific products. We will spend some time at the meeting reviewing potential corridor paths and courses developed by DOT consistent with the guiding principles. So you'll see how this guidance you're developing will be used. There's also flexibility to identify other issues for consideration in the report as our discussion evolves. So here are our future meetings. We've updated the work plan and flow of activities for future meetings. So this sh slide shows the key agenda items at upcoming meetings as we're planning the rest of the summer and into the fall. Please note that every meeting will continue to con include public comment period as well as an update to the task force on public input received since they met last. We are looking at ways to continue the public involvement at this time including opportunities for virtual engagement, as well as in-person meetings that adhere to social distancing requirements. We're planning one more webinar in this current series, and this is scheduled for June 25th. This webinar will provide a brief update on technical activities, and then we'll work as a group on a few more specific needs and guiding principles, as we will do in our broadband discussion today. Meetings six through nine will occur in July through October. And as Christina mentioned, we are still working on the format of these meetings and whether they will be in person, virtual, or some kind of hybrid. We will share the dates and the formats as soon as it, that's possible. What we do know is that meetings six through eight will focus heavily on reaching consensus on the task force recommendations. So that report can be drafted. At meeting six, we will seek to wrap up the discussion on needs, at meeting seven on guiding principles, 
at meeting eight, the instructions for project development and beyond, including implementation strategies. All this work will put you in a position to have a draft report ready following your September meeting for public comment, and then a final report adopted at your October meeting and ready to transmit to the governor and the legislature by November 15th. Today we have a short reminder of the government and the sunshine requirements as we often do. Generally speaking, task force members should not communicate verbally, email, or via a third party with another task force member on items under consideration for the task force. You may of course communicate on matters unrelated to the task force topics. Diane Gumet from the Office of the Attorney General is on the webinar as well and can answer any questions regarding the Sunshine Law as it relates to the task force when we get to the question and answer part of the agenda. And you have her contact information in case you have any additional questions. So on to kind of the roll call component of this, all task force members were given a unique link to sign in. And as task force members logged in, we noted your attendance. I'll now read through the names and organizations and note who is present, who's not in attendance, and who may be a substitute. If you are a substitute and we did not recognize your attendance, please send an email to Jennifer as soon as you can so we can make sure that we are everyone is recognized. So you've heard from Christina Colon from the Florida Department of Transportation. She's present. Mario Rubio is not able to join us from the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity, but James Stansberry is his alternate. Chris Wynn is here from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Mark Futrell is here from the Florida Public Service Commission. Commissioner Jeff Kennard is here representing the Hernando Citrus Metropolitan Planning Organization. Scott Coons is here representing the North Central Florida Regional Planning Council. Charles Lee is here representing Audubon, Florida, Kent Wimmer, Defenders of Wildlife, Commissioner Scott Carnahan, Citrus County Commission is here, James Mayer is here, representing the Florida Department of Economic Protection, Nancy Brown is here from the Florida Department of Education, Michael Napier is here from the Florida Department of Health, Mayor Matt Surrency is here, representing the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, Jim Patton is here representing the Department of Business and Professional Regulations. Rusty Skinner is not able to join us today. He represents Career Source Florida. Commissioner Kathy Bryant is here representing Marion County Commission. Warren Zwanka of Swanee River Water Management District is not able to join us today, but he has an alternate. Ben Glass is here. Jeanette Seacrest is here representing the Southwest Florida Water Management District. Jeff Prather is here, representing St. John's River Water Management District. Mike Woods is here, representing the Lake Sumter Metropolitan Planning Organization. Valerie Hancher is here, representing the Ocala Marion County Transportation Planning Organization. Rock Meeks is not able to join us from the Levy County Commission. Sean Sullivan, representing the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council, is represented by Brian Ellis today. Brian, thank you for joining us. Bradley Arnold is here representing Sumter County. Phil Fulmer is here representing the Florida Trucking Association. Chris Saliba is here representing the Florida Rural Water Association. Bill Ferry is here representing the Florida Internet and Television Association. Danielle Ruiz said she'd be a little late. She represents the Florida Economic Development Council. Kurt Williams is here representing the Florida Farm Bureau Federation. Vernon Lauter, who represents the College of Central Florida, is not able to join us today, but Dr. Stanley Sider, representing the Lake Sumter State College, is here today. Paul Owens is here, representing Thousand Friends of Florida. Jason Lauritsen is here, representing the Florida Wildlife Corridor. Zach Prusak is here, representing the Na Nature Conservancy. Hugh Harling is representing the East Central Florida Regional Planning Council. And Katie Trinusco is here representing Volunteer Florida. And I've just heard that Rock Meeks is indeed here today. So Rock, good morning, thank you very much. And he represents the Levy County Commission. All right, 
so that concludes our um, roll call. We, uh, the main part of today's agenda focuses on understanding broadband deployment opportunities in our study area and how they can be coordinated with corridor planning. So to begin this discussion, Will Watts, FDOT's chief engineer, will provide a brief background presentation. Will, I'm gonna hand it off to you. Thanks, Christine. Good morning, and thanks everybody for attending today. <clears throat> I'm gonna to give a brief presentation today on opportunities for coordinating the MCORS corridors with broadband deployment. And then we'll introduce a panel of subject matter experts to talk through some of the details and any questions that, that you may have. One of the innovative features of the MCOR statute is envisioning that these corridors would be multi-use, including the potential to include broadband, energy distribution, and water and sewer utilities. <clears throat> In the past few months, we've all been experiencing on a daily basis the importance of broadband and advanced telecommunications capability for working from home, shopping from home, online learning, medical appointments, video chats with family and friends. We've also seen the challenges that many Florida, Florida residents and businesses have facing in parts of the state that are not well served by broadband today, particularly, particularly in our rural areas. So the discussion today is about the opportunities that MCORS provides, and it is very timely. Before we get into details, I wanna highlight a few takeaways from today's discussion. First, broadband deployment is primarily a private sector function, and ultimately, the timing and location of these investments are driven by the market. Second, a transportation corridor is not a requirement for broadband to be deployed. There are many ways to get broadband where it is needed, including broadband and the planning activities of a transportation corridor can facilitate broadband infrastructure in some very unique ways. The department wants to be able to support broadband where we're able to. We recognize the value of improving broadband connectivity statewide, and we wanna work with the industry, other state agencies, and the local governments to be part of the solution. Broadband is a high-speed data transmission link that connects people to the internet and other digital resources. Broadband commonly refers to high-speed internet access that is always on and faster than traditional dial-up access on the telephone connection. With co compatible equipment, broadband connections allow a user to connect many different devices at once. The Federal Communications Commission, or FCC, defines broadband as high-speed internet with 25 megabytes per second for download and three megabytes per second for upload for fixed services to residential areas. The FCC does not have a single benchmark for mobile service, mobile service, but they consider 4G LTE long-term evolution as the best proxy for advanced communication capability in a mobile environment. Generally, this is advertised at a speed of five mega, megabytes per second download and one megabyte per second upload. Broadband includes several high-speed transmission technology or types, both fixed and wireless. Some of the common technologies are shown here. Each of these approaches has its advantages and disadvantages. And generally, technology implemented is what makes sense from a market perspective. Often when we discuss broadband, you will hear the, firm, the term fiber. Fiber involves strands of optical glass that transmits data in a form of light. Fiber often is preferred because it has higher carrying capacity and speed with lower operating costs, but it does have a high initial installation cost. All right, so broadband connectivity provides improved quality and higher quality quantity of information. Broadband is considered a transformative enabling technology as it facilitates information sharing, efficiency, and productivity in multiple areas. A lot of you have lived through a lot of these topics just to go through them. Education, where we need remote access for lectures, shared learning facilities, healthcare, which includes telehealth, telemedicine via high definition video calls, 
economic development, improved infrastructure to attract businesses and workers, agriculture, modernization through high-tech and precision agriculture, mobility, improved safety, traffic management, transit, including the ability to telecommute, public safety, information sharing related to law enforcement, emergencies and other risks, government, services delivered more efficiently, civil engagement, live streaming video and interactive programs. Studies have shown a high economic return from broadband investment. A 2016 World Bank study estimated that a 10% point increase in broadband penetration, for example, from 70% to 80%, can result in a 1.2% increase in gross domestic product. A comprehensive statewide study in, in Indiana by Purdue University in 2018 estimated that for every dollar invested in broadband, returns approximately $4 in economic benefit. Florida has a high level of broadband deployment overall, but significant gaps in our rural areas. It is most, in the most recent national report, the FCC estimated that 98.2% 98 of Florida residents living in urban areas have access to fixed broadband at the FCC standard of 25 slash three but only 77.9% of the rural residents. Note that these numbers refer to whether there is a broadband connection at the speed to the census block, not to actual adoption by individual households. Several of the counties within the particular high percentage of unserved or underserved residents are in the MCOR study area. For example, Dixie, Levy, Gilchrist, Jefferson counties all had less than 30% broadband access in 2017. The map here shows where we have a large concentration of providers and service in the study area, the yellow and the red. In areas in which there are few or no providers, Jennifer Stoltz will cover some of this data in more detail later in the presentation. Here's a simplified schematic view of high-speed internet network infrastructure from the public internet to the consumer. The infrastructure is composed of broadband provider, which, which is the backbone trunk line, the middle mile, and the last mile of service, service provider link. The infrastructure has two forms of data transmissions, wired through fiber, cable, or DSL, and wireless through satellite or microwave station. The backbone consists of very large capacity trunks, usually fiber optics that connect to multiple lines capable of transmitting large amounts of data. It provides a path for the exchange of information that local or regional networks can connect with for long distance travel data transmissions. The data routes and the backbone connections are owned by the private providers, commercial, government, academic, or other network centers. The middle mile links the backbone to the internet service provider or the telecommunication provider's core network or telecommunications exchange, in some communities, the middle mile may connect anchor institutions such as schools, hospitals, public buildings that enable them to share applications, infrastructure, and other resources. The last mile brings the connection to the resident's home and small businesses within the telephone exchange or cable company service area. Rural and underserved communities are often limited middle mile and last mile infrastructure. Like other forms of infrastructure, broadband deployment can be expensive. The USDOT estimates the average cost of fiber deployment at the wide range of $6,600 to $267,000 per mile. Our recent experience of installing ITS fiber on the FTOT network for traffic cameras and variable message signs as an agency has cost around $72,000 per mile. The National Internet and Television Association has estimated that capital costs account for about half the cost of providing fiber, with the remaining represented by operating costs. In the National Broadband Plan 2010, the FCC estimated that about three quarters of the capital cost is associated with the placement of the fiber either on the ground or on the poles. They also estimated that running a fiber, a strand of fiber through an existing conduit is three to four times less expensive than a new build. 
So whether we do, so whatever we can do to bring down the capital placement costs helps makes the entire deployment more cost effective. As I mentioned at the start of the presentation, broadband deployment is a private sector market-driven function. However, given our statutory capabilities and the economics just discussed, we do believe there are opportunities for MCORs and other transportation corridors to facilitate broadband deployment. First, transportation right-of-way can be a location for broadband, conduit, fiber, or other wireless systems, reducing the cost for taxpayers. This can be helpful, particularly in building out middle-mile systems. Secondly, we can coordinate highway construction with broadband installation. For example, dig once approaches where we install conduit as we're building highways, either to meet current demand or to have availability for future demand. In some cases, there may be opportunity to place fiber on utility poles, or if an electric utility is considering including their linear infrastructure in the right-of-way. These types of approaches could significantly reduce the cost of deployment for both right-of-way and construction, but broadband providers could contribute to the cost to design and construct conduits. FTOT procedures and federal regulations already contain provisions for accommodation of utility facilities along the existing right-of-way for highway projects. As these systems are installed, we can consider whether to provide potential connecting points for third parties to access conduit, similar to where we locate interchanges or other highway access points. We also recognize the planning involved in MCORS provides an opportunity to take a big picture look at future infrastructure planning at a regional scale to make sure economic development, workforce, education, healthcare, and other institutions have the connectivity they need for the future. In many cases, the common anchor, community anchor institutions can help build the market for broadband in a, sim in a smaller area. In fact, we need to consider our own operations as one source of demand for broadband in many parts of the state. <clears throat> Some other considerations to keep in mind as we consider these opportunities. How do we accommodate future growth and demand? For example, inst installing spare fiber and empty conduit now. Upgrading technology over time to provide higher speed and quality. Removing barriers to investment. The FCC has found that regulatory barriers such as permitting process and zoning restrictions can delay broadband build outs, slow transitions from legacy networks, and services to next generation networks can impede wireless infrastructure projects to deploy advanced networks. This is an area where we can all work together. Providing non-discriminatory, competitively neutral access to FDOT right away for utility and service providers by maintaining common carriage and wholesale access on the broadband infrastructure. Providing access to all residents, recognizing that even if we build out the infrastructure, there may be some residents unable to afford it or unable to take advantage of it because they don't have a computer or other smart device at home. So we need to keep working as a state to look at opportunities to close the digital divide. So we did look at some other states for good examples of coordinating broadband and transportation. We reviewed these states' policy to identify lessons learned. Note that most of these focus, most of these focus on existing transportation corridors, and they all reflect the unique market and regulatory environment in each state. Arizona's 2021 budget included nearly 50 million in funding for smart highway corridors for the Arizona Department of Transportation to install over 500 miles of broadband conduit and other and fiber optic cable along designated highway segments throughout the rural areas of the state. These corridors will improve highway safety while providing future broadband capacity for smart infrastructure projects in Arizona's rural and tribal areas. Arizona state laws allows the state to install broadband con conduit in connection with rural highway construction if funds are received to cover the cost. The installation will not be paid for with existing highway or state general funds, but through a federally funded state program managed by the Arizona Strategic Enterprise Technology Digital Arizona Project. The Arizona Department of Transportation will be requested to bury multiple empty fiber optic conduits along a specific 
state highway, use an existing right of way wherever possible. The conduit will be leased to broadband providers on a cost recovery basis. The providers would be expected to agree to, to install fiber before the conduits were constructed. In California, in support of a statewide initiative to support broadband adoption, the California DOT, Caltrans, in ca calibration with the California Public Utilities Commission, has been tasked to identify strategic broadband corridors and develop stra strategies for deployment of broadband in these areas. A new task force will build on prior examples, such as deployment of broadband along US 395 in the Eastern Sierras. This project connected 251 community anchor institutions, such as schools, libraries, hospitals, public safety, and other government institutions, including three military bases, seven Indian reservations, and three college campuses. The project also connected to other service providers, telephone, cable, wireless networks at 65 points of interconnection. In Indiana, the DOT has launched a broadband corridor program to remove barriers preventing broadband providers from accessing right-of-way along Indiana interstates and limited access highways. Under this program, Indiana DOT will assess a fee to industry for the ability to occupy space within limited access right-of-way and intended to pay for maintenance and management of the broadband corridor. In some cases, Indiana DOT may opt for resource sharing agreements with broadband providers to expand state-owned data transport facilities in areas where the state does not have broadband infrastructure. <clears throat> House Bill 969 passed this year by the Florida Legislature has several important provisions related to broadband. This bill is now in the governor's office for signature. This bill designates the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity as the lead agency to facilitate broadband expansion in Florida, creates a new office, the Florida Office of Broadband within DEO for the purpose of developing, marketing, and promoting broadband internet service in the state. It also requires DEO to create a strategic plan for increased broadband in the use of Florida, broadband use in Florida. This plan must include a process to review and verify public input regarding transmission speeds and availability of internet service. One key outcome of the plan is to position the state to, to apply for federal grants from the FCC, U.S. Department of Agriculture, and other agencies. This office also is authorized to build, build and facilitate local technology planning partnerships encourage the use of broadband internet service, especially in the rural, unserved, and underserved communities of the state through the grant programs and monitor, participate in, and provide input in the proceedings of the FCC and other agencies to ensure Florida is best positioned to benefit from the federal and state broadband deployment programs. It also defines underserved areas in Florida as geographic areas with no broadband provider currently offering a connection speed greater than or equal to 10 megabytes up, up, upload and one megabyte download. It also authorizes FDOT to spend up to $5 million annually, beginning with our fiscal year 22-23 for projects to assist in broadband deployment within, within or adjacent to multi-use corridors with priority for rural areas of opportunity. If this bill is signed into law by the governor, we will develop guidelines on for how these funds can be used in support of the statewide broadband strategic plan. The $5 million through FDOT can help other private sector, state, and federal sources. We anticipate opportunities to build partnerships with the private sector, building on some of the examples in other states. We also anticipate the ability to leverage the work of other agencies including the new responsibilities provided by DEO by House Bill 969. This slide also shows some of the potential funding sources from other federal agencies available to assist with planning for and implementation of broadband. As we get ready to hear from the rest of our panelists, here's some topics the task force could discuss later in today's agenda. Needs, guiding principles, and implementation guidance for DOT. All right, Christina, back to you. Thank you, Will. 
So now we're going to hold questions for Will until we get the panel started, but Will's going to be available to answer specific questions if anyone has them, but we really want to use our panel as we have them today, and we really appreciate them joining us. So now we'd like to convene a brief discussion about the subject we don't among the, the, Panelists, if we can um, mute you, you right now. We're going to do a standard deviation, and that is going to still be our computers and your personal department, but you're going to have to look at more things. Christina, somehow you unmuted all of us, I believe. That's what I asked during this hearing. We're looking to be there. There's a lot of agencies on the board, too. Agencies need to be reached out to their pump regulation. I want to offer our support to you guys. That's going to be my recommendation. If all task force members can please uh, mute your computers right now because we're getting ready to open up a conversation. Um, so if you can self mute for now, and then when we raise hands and I call on you, you unmute for yourself and that way we can keep some of that background noise at bay if you don't mind. I mean, please be patient. We're all learning as we navigate this. So I appreciate that. So now on to the panel discussion. Um, so we're going to have a brief discussion about the sub amongst the subject matter experts that will help us think about specific deployment opportunities in our four county study area. So in addition to Will's expertise, we have four subject matter experts joining us for today. Uh, we have Brad Swanson and um, he is the president and CEO of the Florida Internet and Television Association. So some of the providers work closely with him day to day on uh, navigating how we do things comprehensively. Bill Lambert is, rep is the director of the Hardy County Economic Development Council. So he's been on the front line looking to implement that as a driver for his community. Dustin German, he is with Rapid Systems and he's a system provider and he's worked with Bill Lambert. So they'll play off of each other a little bit. And we have Charlie Dudley. He is a managing partner with Florida Partners LLC, but he's worked closely with Brad Swanson, kind of more on some of the policy work that's been done. So the panel members have not developed a formal discussion. I think uh, a lot of information was provided by Will for us to think about. I've asked each of them to briefly introduce themselves and their organization, as well as some of their initial thoughts about broadband deployment in the study area. We'll then open up for discussion with task force members. And so now remind yourself, your mic is live. So we need you to mute at your end until we call upon you. We don't want any mishaps and uh, to keep the airwaves clear as possible so we can hear our panelists. And so our panelists have their cameras on now, so we should all be able to see them. And uh, we'll do the panel introductions. And then as we get into some of the Q&A and asking you, the task force members, to raise your hand, um, when you want to speak. And then panelists, when you hear the questions, if you can give me some visual cue, whether it's raising your hand or leaning in a little bit, although you're all leaning in, uh, so that I know who I can call on and if you want to follow up with one of the other task force. So this raise hand feature for everyone is for task force member discussion only. Members of the public, you will have an opportunity to speak during the public comment part of the agenda. So it looks like we have right around 30 minutes for this robust conversation. And I know that Will has provided a lot for us to think about, but let's start with the panel introductions. Brad, would you like to start with that? So um, I'm Brad Swanson. I'm the president and CEO of Florida Internet and Television. Sorry. And, um, we represent five cable companies in Florida that uh, reach 97% of Florida's population. And our members include Comcast, uh, Charter, uh, Cox, Atlantic Broadband, and Mediacom. 
and we are um, we, we are the the evolution, if you will, of one of the first cable systems in America, which was down in the Keys. And I think that sums up the association. I think from my perspective of opening comments, I have to compliment uh, President Galvano, Speaker Oliva, and ultimately Governor DeSantis for, um, for leading this MCORS uh, challenge. And, and when we think of a multi-use corridor and to know that the state is designing what will be the new arteries for the state of Florida with broadband intentionality in mind, it, it, it excites myself, it excites our members, and um, to see the, the vision of the state, of the state leaders um, placing that in there and then putting it into FDOT's um, hands, that is, um, that is amazing. And, and I think once FDOT picked it up, as, as most people should know, uh, Florida's DOT is literally one of the leaders in the nation and both in technology and in smart roadways. So, participate on these panels, and um, as far as being a part of the 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 conversation from beginning to till now and, and ongoing, is is not common. And our industry um, is grateful for the opportunity to be here. So we have to applaud um, Secretary Tebow, and of course Will Watson and your team for um, how inclusive you're being on this project. And so with that, that's my opening remarks. Thank you, Brad. Dustin, would you like to introduce yourself to the team? Thank you. My name is Dustin German with Rapid Systems. Uh, we've been providing solutions, connectivity solutions in Florida for over 20 years from the uh, beginnings of the internet to broadband today and mixed and hybrid fiber wireless technology. Um, certainly an exciting project to look at what's kind of sort of planned as well as what capabilities there could be in the future because there is the technology to today and the technology of tomorrow that will be out there. So I think it's very forward thinking of FDOT. Um, wish I knew the names of the people to mention them as elegantly as Brad, but uh, we're learning as we go, so uh, we'll go ahead and pass it on from there. Thank you so much. Charlie Dudley, you've been involved a lot in the policy side of this. Um, you'd like to introduce yourself to the task force. We're having troubles hearing you. Can you try that again, Charlie? How's that? Is that better? Excellent. Yes. Great. Sorry. Thank you. Um, appreciate the opportunity. I, I've been, I, I'm a native of, of Florida. I was born in Fort Myers, so been around a while and I've got about 30 years of experience in doing public policy in the telecommunications communication world. So appreciate the opportunity to be here uh, and to be part of this project. I think I want to first echo Brad. It's, uh, it's great that Florida is having this conversation now so that these corridors can be planned so that adequate space uh, can be available in the right of way for really a technology neutral reservation uh, for providers to come in. Um, you'll also find that um, as wireless technology evolves along these corridors, um, the wireless technology relies on uh, what we generally call fiber uh, backhaul. Uh, most of your traffic that occurs on a on a voice wireless network and a data wireless network ends up on a fiber network, and a lot of times it's on a our members' cable uh, fiber backbone network as well. So we we appreciate the planning that's going in. Look forward to the partnership and doing it, and I'm happy to answer questions and look forward to working with everybody. I appreciate uh, Dustin too being on here because I think everyone knows the internet while it started. Uh, as a government uh, communications tool, research tool, uh, the private sector uh, has has you know really uh, taken over in terms of the capital investment in the in the billions, probably the trillions by now, uh, that's developed the internet into what it is today. Uh, it's a critical part of our lives, and, and even more so as we're seeing with uh, COVID, is how it impacts us from a job and economic development perspective, as well as our our kids, uh, and them trying to do schoolwork remotely, whether whether your child's home from college or whether your child's in a K-12 setting, it's uh, it's obviously a, a critical thing. And while 
Florida is generally an urban state and has done a good job with deployment, we still have some significant areas of Florida that do, do not have what I would call access to the internet. When I say that, meaning that a customer or a business cannot get uh, speeds of at least 25 through in a timely fashion, whether it's a week, two weeks, or some reasonable amount of time without incurring additional construction, special construction charges, uh, like some companies uh, charge for connectivity. So, you know, we've got to figure out how to push that deployment out, uh, whether it's a wired technology that's being pushed out, or if it's a wired technology in combination with a wireless technology. And then, as you know, as we watched on Saturday, as, as uh, Americans entered space again, which was pretty exciting, uh, Mr. Musk also has a low orbiting uh, satellite company out there where, uh, and as do others, where they're launching new low orbit satellites that will have much less latency uh, and will be a much more effective tool for providing, I think, end user uh, broadband down the road too. So I think as we're moving forward, it's important to, to talk about this problem and realize that there are multiple solutions out there. I'd love to say my clients have the solution. I think we have the premier, most reliable solution, but it's not going to be the most economical solution and one that can be readily uh, pushed out as maybe as quickly as other technologies uh, to so we can make sure that Floridians have the benefits of access to broadband. Excellent. Thank you for that oversight. Bill, so you've been out in the community helping to implement this and driving economic development as well for your community. Can you share um, kind of that overview with the task force and members of the public that are on this, and I believe you're self-muted right now, so um, let me go ahead and open up the mic for you to introduce yourself. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I want to echo the other participants' comments. Uh, Will, I want to commend you on your presentation. I thought it was extremely comprehensive and pretty much spot on. In Hardy County, we decided that we were going to try to bring our community out of the wilderness Almost uh, over over 10 years ago, we started looking at ways to deploy a cost-effective, technologically sound, and ubiquitous broadband program. And we began looking at the various companies and the various ways that they were deploying broadband at the time. And I ultimately stumbled onto Dustin German and Rapid Systems at the recommendation of some of the other broadband uh, providers at that time. I have since learned that D Dustin is somewhat of a contemporary Tesla or Edison. He does have a particularly good understanding of broadband. So you have to be careful when you work with Dustin because sometimes he forgets to wear his pants to work, but he is he really is a neat guy and he has done a fantastic job for us in Hardy County. We worked diligently with the broadband program that uh, was attempted to be deployed back around 2012 through the BTOP program the federal government had put forth. And unfortunately, that program was simply a middle mile program and broadband in rural communities or anywhere will not work without a last mile provider. Dustin was able to come up with a very unique system for us. And Will, you might wanna change your presentation. I think there might be a seventh type of broadband we refer to ours as fixed wireless. It is a bit of a hybrid in that we do use microwave, we use radio waves, we use fiber, we use all of it, but we have pretty much deployed broadband throughout our community for a very cheap economical solution. And I would encourage any of the panel members in any of these rural areas that would like to look at our system, we'd be more than glad to share you know, the things we've done here um, I think it's probably gonna be the best way to skin the cat down the road. I, I do have some concerns about the conduit and how the access to the conduit is going to be provided. Um, we have run into problems over the last 10 years, kind of being squeezed out with uh, certain types of technology with the larger companies. And somehow we've we've got to find a way to have the rural areas be competitive with more urban dense areas. So I look forward to the continued discussion. Um, I, I, I know that we can do rural broadband in a competitive way here, and we're, we're willing to show it to anybody that wants to look at it. So I'll pause for now and hopefully chime in later. Thank you.
Excellent. Thank you so much. That's a great overview for our task force members to begin to consider everything from big picture policy to driving economic development to literally putting it in the ground and making sure we have the right technology at the right time. For our task force members, we've always looked at this as multimodal, multi-use. That's the guidance the legislature gave us. Um, so this begins that innovation of where does this fit in our, in our needs and how does this drive guiding principles and ultimately implementation. So we're really hitting the entire arc of that conversation with this panel today. So we've already have a couple hands up of our task force members and the first one that went up of course was our good friend Bill Ferry who is um, representing the Florida Internet and Television Association. So with that remember all task force members you are all unmuted right now and we're asking you to self mute but when I call your name go ahead and unmute and ask your question of the panelists. Well, Bill? Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Bill Ferry here. Um, yes, a very good presentation by Will, and it really made me think about, uh, frankly, policy and knowing that we have a lot of representatives of state and local government on here, it, it prompts me to have a question here for all panelists, and that's what policies might the state and local governments follow to promote broadband deployment and adoption, uh, particularly in the rural areas? Uh, to ensure that the private industry can serve as many customers in the wide area with the best internet possible. So hopefully that'll get some discussion going. All right, um, go ahead and, and mute again. So panelists, what do you think about that? I mean, we've talked a lot about the, the need for uh, kind of that digital divide, addressing some of that. So which of the panelists would like to kind of take that first? Thank you, Bill, for that question. I'm happy to. Please, Charlie. Okay, thank you. I think there's a number of things. Um, one is, you know, we believe the governor will be signing the, the legislation that, uh, that Will outlined earlier. And that's really critical because Florida doesn't really have a state broadband deployment plan. And for those of you who don't know, you may be seeing that there's several different federal <laughs> programs available uh, for grants and uh, Florida's not been in a, as good a position it needs to be to help uh, facilitate and, and win some of those grant awards from the billions of dollars that the Department of Agriculture and the FCC have available for uh, projects. So we think that's a, a huge uh, first step that needs to happen from a, from a government policy perspective. The second thing is really, you know, the MCOR's approach of beginning to plan and coordinate, uh, you know, plan the corridors accordingly so that we can uh, reserve some capacity. And to Bill Lambert's point, uh, if you're going to put conduit in, it needs to be what we call an interduct, interduct of approach. It needs to be a bank of four-inch conduits so that providers can have their own individual four-inch, uh, you know, uh, conduit to use. That's important from a network security perspective. It's also important uh, for maintenance and upgrade ability. Um, I think uh, be curious as other people's reaction to that as well, but you know, whether it's nine or seven uh, four inch uh, conduits, they can all be grouped together uh, so that they're readily accessible. It, it's also gonna be important that we have access to what I call the linear or the, or the right of way next to the corridor running parallel to the corridor. We've also got to really pay attention to some of the perpendicular crossings, and I'm not a, a road engineer or a road builder, but there's going to be, you know, obviously depending on the exact route that is uh, recommended and chosen for this corridor, you're going to be crossing existing uh, county and state roads, many of which already have fiber runs or other communications networks running across them. Obviously, those are going to have to be relocated. Uh, it would be great if we could have some cost sharing in that relocation generally on a transportation relocate the industry does not get any uh, reimbursement for that uh, that causes dollars to be lost that could otherwise be used to upgrade or to further uh, build out uh, networks it's it's just you know money that we lose because there's there's a need obviously to expand the transportation facilities and we're there because uh, that's where we were told to be. We got a permit to be there, and this is where we were told by the county, the city, or the state to put our facilities. So as we're looking at those crossings, it also would be great to put conduit in those crossings. Uh, that way we can go back in or we can go in along with the construction and you know move the facilities, hopefully move them one time, 
you know, these concepts of a dig once, uh, I think are very, very good planning concepts that would be great public policy uh, to adopt. And I think the final thing, and we, we may, we've talked about uh, doing this with the state, it may not work with the current economic climate in Florida, but many states have adopted uh, sales tax exemptions for purchases of broadband equipment and facilities and the, and the labor costs. Uh, it, you may or may not know that in Florida, we have to pay uh, sales tax on not only the cost of the fiber and the other broadband electronics that we deploy, but also on the labor used to install that. Um, so there's been, I know Texas and others have done some pretty big programs where they were trying to stimulate and have stimulated broadband investment uh, with a state tax policy. Now, again, uh, with COVID, Florida may not be in a position to do that, but I, we do think that there's some ideas like that too that uh, would be very relevant to uh, adopting some policy decisions that could be of assistance. Excellent. Any additional follow-up? All right, we've got some. Yeah, Bill, what, what would you like to add? Just sitting here thinking and understanding how our system is built, I think that when the ultimate design is done for the broadband deployment down the corridor, some considerations should be given to utilizing the, the very tall light towers that are put at each of the interchanges. Those, those towers, whatever, could be retrofitted for excellent rural broadband deployment. Um, we have a system that we could deploy seven to 10 mile radiuses off of those towers. And I'm not sure how tall they are. They look to me to be about 150 feet tall. So whether you use that for direct deployment or whether it's used for microwave, pole to pole, down the corridor, there's all kinds of ways to be innovative and creative in building this corridor to deploy rural broadband. That's a great point. I know that we talk a great deal about that middle mile and last mile of, of that access. So that's, that's a great suggestion. We do have a number of hands up of task force members. Um, and I, we would like to hear from some of the local governments as well. And I, I see that we uh, just had one hand go up. So um, let me go ahead and ask Charles Lee. I know your hand went up pretty quick. Um, so what would you like to ask the panel? And you may be self-muted, Charles. So if you want to unmute. Okay, very good. Yes, uh, sir. Can you hear me we now? hear you. Yes, sir. Uh, it, it appears to me that given the costs being cited for a wide scale broadband deployment, um, that if the Florida legislature were to appropriate somewhere in the range of less than $200 million, the hardware, including the cabling for broadband, could be pretty much networked at that cost level throughout the rural areas of Florida. Um, of course, the legislation that got us here to MCORS tagged broadband onto a highway system. And uh, in order for that highway system to be constructed, uh, we may be looking at as much as $20, 23000000000 billion if you took the cost per mile of contemporary highway projects and projected it over the potential 330 miles of imports. So I'm, I'm wondering from each of you panelists, uh, what can you tell us about, just give us a guesstimate of what the capital cost to put robust uh, broadband through our rural communities in Florida might be? And, and would it make sense to perhaps pursue that objective in a way that did not have to wait for the extensive uh, planning, engineering, and other uh, things associated with a large highway project? All right, that is a great question for you. Um, panelists, yeah, Dustin, please. That's a very interesting thought because traditional broadband, I think the way that Charlie was discussing is where you're putting in four inch conduits and you're stuffing as much physical fiber in there as possible. And the dynamics of service provider networks have really changed now where 
we're not utilizing all that conduit, all those fibers. I mean, literally what you used to be able to get across one fiber, now that one fiber can deliver 80, 10 gigabit uh, links across a single pair of fiber. And there are even technologies out there now that do it over a single fiber and one color on the way up and one color on the way down. So, you know, my hope would be that with this MCORS project, that instead of necessarily following all of the, the other folks of what have been done, that we had the potential to look at newer, better ways of doing it to extend those dollars out. Now, if the cable companies need, which they rate, may rightly so, and in their core infrastructure need four inch conduits and 288 or 1,000 fibers within that conduit, great. But companies like myself and other companies that are probably more apt to getting out to the rural uh, areas initially uh, with less build time of not having to you know, continually lay fiber, that that infrastructure could be shared across a variety of folks where maybe that one conduit, really, I only need one or two fibers out of that one conduit and not all of that. And that greatly reduces the cost. And I think that goes to uh, what the gentleman is asking is, how do we stretch those dollars or make that you know, uh, more beneficial? That's over there. Um, and it's something that Bill said. Bill said, hey, you know, there's all these light towers, but there's also, you know, when I drive up and down the street, I look at, I, I you know, uh, I've got this disease of infrastructure. So I look at every cable in the air and every antenna and camera. And I say, wow, you know, these camera towers that are put up by FDOT, they're, they're, you, they have one or two cameras on them. And they could have a whole bunch of more infrastructure that could exist on there. And that could reduce everybody's cost. And reducing cost is is paramount to reducing the time to get out to the rural infrastructure because as charlie was saying it takes time you got to put conduit in you got to put it in the conduit you got to certify it there's so much stuff to do where even in a wireless first technology if you went in there to deliver some of the services wireless first and then followed up five or second uh to there we could get there a lot quicker by being a little bit i'm not going to say smarter uh, uh, I'm looking for a better word, Bill, back me up here, but uh, maybe a little bit more rural thinking or something along those lines. Excellent. All right, so we do have a few more hands up. And, and next, I'd like to take the liberty of calling on Valerie Hancher, who has her hand up. She's a local elected official as well as a businesswoman. And I think, as we all know right now, we're all wearing many hats, whether you're teaching your kids at home or working from home and trying to keep other things, and then you add to it uh, a task force member as well. Valerie, what did you want to ask of the panel? Hi, good morning. Thank you all. It's all very uh, mind-boggling, kind of. And I think the word you were looking for, by the way, Dustin, is innovative, different innovative way to do it. So. And we, I am in a rural area, Dunellen. Um, you know, our population is 1,800. Um, and we have like AT&T here um, and uh, other, you know, networks that we can use. And my thing is, is that there's a couple of issues. Like my daughter's fifth grade teacher, she's now 19, but we're still in contact. She lives in an area that receives the, you know, can get internet, she's lucky. However, it kept going down during all these periods and she was trying to teach, you know, her students through Zoom and, you know, she literally would have a day or two of no internet accessibility because it had gone down. So that's an issue of how, you know, if we add more people, add more people, how are we going to keep it active so that we can, you know, keep doing our business. I mean, I'm in real estate. I have to have my computer up and going. And during these Zoom meetings, sometimes they do go, it does go in and out, and I'm within the city limits. That's one issue, and then I'll, I'll just give you two more. Um, do the companies have the funding to look at doing these large projects? Um, you know, I know uh, Mr. Lee said, you know, just the road building will probably be in the 20 to 23 billion dollar mark. What funding do you have that's going to get you there shovel ready when the state of Florida is shovel ready? And my last question is, 
where are you going to get the manpower to do that shovel ready um, project? And how can the cities and the counties help you get ready for them? Those were my questions. Thank you all. Excellent. Thank you, Valerie. So I, I heard reliability, manpower, costs, and, and, and kind of partnerships along the way um, of delivering a program. So which of our panelists would like to take this? All right, Charlie, this one's yours. Thank you. Well, I'll just get started. I, I, first of all, there's, I think it's important to understand there's, in my opinion, there's no silver bullet and there's no one technology solution that works. I mean, I think Dustin did a good job of explaining you got to crawl before you walk, before you run. Um, we need to be looking at uh, services that get deployed with a minimum of 25.3 and they need to be scalable, meaning they need to be able to, to go to much higher speeds and capacities to the very point that you're raising you might be on a system that's that's supposedly 25.3, but the reality is with the use that we're seeing, the historical levels of use that we're seeing in this country, which I don't think is going to slow down. I, I think there's a lot of questions about what the future of work at home versus work at work is going to be like. Uh, also, you know, should you have, you know, God forbid, a, a recurrence here in the fall or winter, you may have kids back home again from schools and or universities. I hope not. Um, I, you know, I because I can appreciate the situation. I happened to pull in my garage last week on the 22nd. My 18 year old daughter was taking her AP stats test and my wife met me in the garage and we don't live in a, a rural area. We're right outside the city limits. She met me in the garage saying, you may not want to go inside because your daughter cannot submit her final answer sheet to the AP people to finish her AP exam because the internet won't accept it right now. And you know, she was just giving me the, hey, here's the heads up warning. Now, within about five minutes, you know, the network allowed her to do that. And crisis uh, was averted because, trust me, you don't want an 18-year-old uh, female about to graduate high school not being able to submit her AP stats test. So I, I think that those problems are going to persist. Now, I think the companies, uh, one of our members has announced a $10 billion funding effort across the country where they're targeting and looking at states, including Florida, uh, for uh, what I call further broadband deployment. Again, that's just one industry, one technology. It's going to take it's going to take a lot. Whether it's again low, low orbiting satellites, uh, technology like the fixed wireless uh, systems that Dustin sells, uh, traditional cable, uh, 5G deployment that uh, some of the wireless companies are are now working on. It's going to take a combination of all those to finish up the six or seven percent of the state that doesn't have readily uh, accessible. Again, those systems have to be designed so that they're upgradable, they're scalable. Uh, to meet uh, future demands and, and needs. Most people, a lot of people believe 100 megs uh, should be kind of the minimum standard. Um, and uh, there's a lot of systems that currently do that. Um, so I think that's the issue. In terms of manpower, uh, in terms of uh, workforce, I think I think that's there. Uh, I think that's uh, available. And, uh, and I think the real issue is going to be, uh, you know, uh, a fight over uh, budget dollars from, from corporate uh, budgets across the country. Uh, part of the part of the way you address that is by having a state that has a, a good broadband program, like I stated before, and you maybe look for some creative public policy solutions, including what you're doing here, which is planning future corridors around broadband deployment so the companies know uh, that they have access to conduit that's already been put in the ground, uh, that they have you know tax policies that are very favorable. Uh, you know, relocate future relocation expenses maybe are take, being taken into account somehow and, and being planned for. Uh, I think those are the things that that you need to be doing. Excellent, Bill. Did you want to add on to that? Uh, <clears throat> I just wanted to give a personal uh, perspective. Hold on, just a second. Um, in Hardy County, we were able to deploy our ubiquitous program and it it's it's about 90 percent ubiquitous there are some areas that we have not been able to serve um, with the with the main system but in making all of this work we learned that it has to be a good program it has to work and when you look at it relative to the power companies the turn of about 1920 most rural areas in florida did not have electricity Today, it's unheard of to go to an area of the state that doesn't have electricity. In addition to that, many of the areas that don't have water and sewer, those that can be those those issues can be resolved. But 
lack of broadband is very serious. It has to be dealt with. When I started in economic development about 20 years ago, the first question was, do you have three-phase power? Today, the first question is, what is your broadband service? So if we're gonna be serious about having an effective corridor program, we have to make certain that this, uh, the fiber is addressed. And frankly, if the corridor had existed in Hardy County, it would have cut our capital investment in half um, because we could have utilized that infrastructure. And we, we built our middle mile program that covers a 20 mile by 40 mile county, 20 by 30 mile county, by 600 square miles for $2 million. And then of course the last mile is more expensive because there's so much equipment, but that's the mile that makes the money for the companies like Rapid System and Dustin. And I think uh, the initial uh, investment for them, which was only 2,500 customers was about six to $8 million, Dustin, somewhere in that range. So we can, we can make it work, but we need the fiber backbone and it will really uh, decrease the capital cost for these rural communities. Excellent, thank you, Dustin. You may be muted, Dustin. Boy, I always do that. Uh, from being a provider for the last several years, uh, and whether or not it's you know cable or LTE, whatever the game is, we always had this oscillating residential business type of solution. And when you come to capacity and everything goes straight up, like with the COVID-19, and we were probably headed toward this anyway, and COVID did us a favor of recognizing this as um, as an issue where all circuits all have capacity all the time. Uh, it really kind of changed the way that providers uh, look at building and scaling their networks. Um, again, nobody ever expected that. We all expected residential to be on after five and business to be on from six to seven. Um, so things have changed on that and hopefully some of the opportunities with the MCORS network allow uh, that infrastructure to be innovative in a way that can assist in the redesigns of these networks that allow us to take on that type of capacity. You know, and some of those things that, that do provide that would be the interconnections between the network providers, because while we're all going to school in Hardy County, some people are going to school on one network, and in order to get over to the other network, you gotta go up to Atlanta, make a left turn, and come back down to Florida again. So MCOR is not only being able to provide you know, connectivity, and we use this word middle mile, and I caution everybody that middle mile is really gone now in today's technology. It's first mile and last mile, they've eroded into the middle mile. There is no more middle mile per, uh, uh, provider, and I'll, Remind those of us that are old enough to remember when you signed up for phone service and somebody asked you, who do you want as your last mile provider? You don't hear that or your long distance provider. You don't hear that question anymore. They're gone. They're out of that situation. And so for the most part is the middle model provider. So that first mile provider and that last mile provider, they're going to interconnect along that MCORS network. So there are some opportunities to help out with the capacity issues that you're talking about. Because if we're able to interconnect locally and potentially across this MCORS network, then we no longer have to go to Atlanta and make a left turn and come back and then have to deal with the latency and capacity of the rest of the internet. Excellent, thank you. Brad, let me uh, hold on just a second if you don't mind. I, I do wanna encourage a lot of our local elected officials that serve on the task force. This is important information and figuring out how we can partner and, and drive economic development as well as education and, and getting goods to the marketplace as well. So Brad, you wanna pick up there and I wanna encourage others to kind of engage in this conversation. Go ahead, Brad. Yeah, I think um, one of the other key components um, when you talk about Zoom um, classes and reaching those those kids that are are educating themselves um, remotely is um, so there's a huge access issue in Florida right now that that believe it or not with existing networks um, there's a solution to getting uh, kids uh, hooked hooked up and and the the case I'm trying to make is. We have, we have a big adoption issue everywhere in the country for folks that are economically struggling. 
And I know our members and um, pretty much every one of the telcos that also provides uh, a broadband connection, they have a low cost internet option. And, yes, and so, so what that is is for kids that qualify for free and reduced lunch, um, they also qualify for $15 a month broadband connectivity where it's available. Now, obviously when you're talking about uh, rural areas that don't have it yet, this is one of those things that we will need to educate those rural areas so that those that are economically struggling, once they do have the cable out front essentially, or the the point to point wireless um, Dustin system, you know, or Dustin's rapid systems, is that these folks need to know about these low cost options to help them to be connected. So, to 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 your point about about networks going down with teachers, I think I think that the smart you know geniuses like Dustin and the guys that that are the operations people in the back office for my members, when they balance the load, I think the overall broadband industry. Um, has been bragging across the board of doing a really good job of handling loads um, and during those middays at those residential providers. Now there's always, you know, those challenges and those exceptions where where the networks, you know, are overburdened and, and those are those are certainly, you know, ones that need to be addressed. But I think it's it's hugely important when we talk about bridging the digital divide, both on these rural corridors and folks that may already have a system running through the area options a long way of connecting school kids that just aren't being taken advantage of to the fullest degree. So I think I think in combination of these new and innovative and multi multi um, or technology neutral systems that it's going to take to reach these new and rural markets, I think it's vitally important that an education plan be, you know, um, travel along with this effort to let those folks know that there's a low cost internet um, option that still has a broadband connectivity of 25.3 or, you know, I, I, I think that's probably the base standard on that, but that's enough for not only the kids to do their work and, and stream, at least at the very base level, but mom or dad can also get on and and stream a, a you know a training class or something like that or, or be online it's available to the whole family not just to the student so i think it's both new technologies reaching these areas but it's also the the existing um, adoption programs that are offered um, by my members and the telcos and and i would assume uh, dustin's company so excellent so. thank you so much so we have a few more hands up um we have uh, Paul Owens. You, your hand went up early, so let me make sure that you're invited to ask the panel a question. Okay, can you hear me, Christine? Yes, sir. Okay, Will Watts said a couple of things I found especially notable in his presentation. Uh, one was that it's not necessary to have a transportation corridor for broadband, and the other was that uh, some other states have expanded broadband without building new highways. So my question for the panel is, could we um, not achieve the goal of expanding broadband connectivity within the corridors sooner as well as cheaper by decoupling it from construction of a highway network that isn't scheduled to be completed until 2030? Dustin? I think you could definitely start. And if you know where the MCORs are, then utilize that because the, your system, your, your broadband as you're attaching people starts going up like this. So you could get a, you could start getting some stuff done prior to then and focusing on your last mile, but the opportunity to utilize the MCOR system uh, I, I want to avoid middle mile for my own purposes here, uh, would certainly be something that uh, as you were ramping up, then you can get over to that highway to gain, uh, and I mean highway as a universal highway type of thing, that you could get over to that to gain uh, a greater amount of broadband would be critical. As Bill said, when we start in a mixed uh, or a hybrid system, there's a cost associated with building that middle mile infrastructure up. And then as your capacity keeps going up, 
that cost of doing it via microwave starts going through the roof and the cost of doing it through fiber starts dropping dramatically. All right, Brad, we have a couple more questions, but you wanna go ahead and add to that? Just, if I can add real quickly to that. Um, I think one of the things um, that can't be underestimated about an NCORS um, project to facilitate the deployment um, is the, the very fact that you have FDOT amalgamating land under their right-of-way acquisition, you know, for private sector companies, any private sector company to deal with 30 to 60 land landholders to try and and have a comparable um you know uh, middle mile line run if you will versus one um single agent to deal with is is huge and the fact that fdot is making these multi-use corridors and including broadband in it is is a it, it's a really big deal so so while the timeline for most regular people look super far out because it's a transportation construction timeline. Um, the time it would take any single private sector company to try and do a deal with 60 different property owners, um, you know, ahead of time, if you will, um, or, or decoupled, that, that could arguably take way longer than the timelines we're looking at with um, these MCOR acquisitions. Thank you, Brad. So, um, the power of a state corridor. You still can you guys still hear me? Yep, we can now. Okay, yeah, the the power of of pulling all of those um, together it cannot be understated um, as to facilitating private sector um, interest in expansion because that that in and of itself helps a huge deal. All right, thank you. And I think that that gets back to that multi-use, multimodal corridor that uh, was was really our driver. Um, we have. I want to invite Matt Cernsey, who's also an elected official and a businessman. And uh, the conversations I've had with Matt, he's also homeschooling some kids sometimes as well. So we're all wearing many hats. So Matt, what questions do you have of the uh, panel? Mac? Okay. You can hear me now. Just gonna we me. can. Uh, yes. Can you hear me, Christine? Yes, Matt. Please go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, thank you, and I appreciate the uh, panel for being here. And uh, it's been good conversation and dialogue to have. Uh, some of the issues that we have, and I'm in a uh, rural part of Florida as well, in North Central Florida. Um, is we have tons of fiber that come through our community. And uh, I live right on Highway 301. There is fiber that runs 200 yards from in front of my house. But we can still only get 13 megabits per second with our uh, current capacity. Not only that, but much of my community as an elected official, they're on a waiting list, waiting for people to come off so that there's enough, uh, I guess, capacity for them to come on, which makes, to me, as just a pure layman, and it makes no sense at all if we have all this fiber that runs in our state highway system, um, and I have two state highways that run through, and they actually intersect, and so they cross each other, north and south, and the other one going east and west, State Road 20, and there's been a lot of construction on those as well, here recently as well, so don't know why we didn't include some of this on that. So my question, I guess, is we have all these state highways. Uh, we have all this power company infrastructure with power poles that currently go to rural parts of Florida. Why can't we use some of that and to connect us? And how will MCORs be any different if we're just getting fiber to these places going through the woods versus going down the state highway system and still not able to connect people because we don't have the capacity to connect them. How is that gonna be any different? And one final point, I've done a lot of stuff with, uh, uh, I guess, trying to 
get rid of the uh, the divide, uh, the digital divide. And with the National League of Cities, we had a discussion, and they were talking about in the Midwest how they use a lot of their uh, co-ops, their power company co-ops, to help run uh, some of this infrastructure. And uh, I know it's not the best; it's not like fiber. I, I fully recognize that, but it's a whole lot better than 13 megabits per second. And we have fiber right out in front of my house. So how do we uh, utilize maybe some of these other avenues uh, of what we already have? And maybe if there's policy that we need to change that allows our communities like mine to be able to hook up with some of this fiber. Thank you. All right. Which of our panelists would like to capture that? Bill, please. I sympathize with your frustration. I, I want to try to use an analogy that might help you. You have that fiber, but if it's analogous to the transmission line system in the state of Florida for electricity, you can have a transmission line that goes through your property, but it's not going to be readily available to put electricity in your house. What we have is we have those, the large power companies have massive transmission systems that send power from uh, the power plant to the substations and from there on it's a distribution system and to correlate that to broadband that would be your last mile provider just because there's fiber there if there's if it's not connected to a data center if it if it's not readily available for information to flow back and forth and someone to manage it and ultimately for you to send a check to someone it's not going to work so we have to make certain that we have systems that are friendly to last mile providers, whether it be the, the cable companies, the, the uh, mobile telephone companies, rapid systems, uh, any of those. But if we have this backbone, I think you're gonna see those companies begin to appear because there'll be a market for them, a good market. Excellent. All right, we have a couple more hands up. So if you don't mind, let's go ahead and capture those. Jason, you've been very patient waiting uh, with your virtual hand up. So what would you like to ask the panel? Jason, you're muted. Would you like to unmute? Yes, uh, thank we you very much. We can hear you. This is Jason Lowerson from the Florida Wildlife Corridor. And uh, it sounds like from many of the, the panelists that there's some low hanging fruit and, and you just addressed some of that with, with Matt's question. Um, my, my take on this is that we have light towers and camera towers, which would be able to provide some capacity with a fixed wireless system. And Bill, you mentioned that that might reach seven to 10 miles radius, at least in your experience in Hardy County. Uh, and, and I'm just, I'm just wondering um, if, if also, um, Dustin, you, you discussed the fact that technology has improved where uh, what used to be packed conduit filled with, filled with fibers can, now you just need a, a couple of fibers to handle the same kind of load. Uh, are, are there, are there late, is there latent capacity in our network right now, uh, represented by those fibers that are running through Highway 301 in front of Matt's house, that uh, you know is is one of the features here that we don't have those last mile providers with their systems existing in what is already a a backbone or a network that we're we're just not tapping into. I mean, does it need to be a new um, a new build, or or can we really? start to do these kinds of partnerships with with uh, existing fiber Dustin, please it has been incredibly difficult to get access to that and even from a municipality we do uh, some public safety work as well and even from a municipality perspective it seems to be a little on the difficult side to get access to uh, the existing fibers. If you're talking about what uh, is existing down some of the roads already. Now remember, there's fibers not only from uh, FDOT and from local traffic systems and other places that exist that would be wonderful to be able to utilize, um, but uh, 
there's also a lot of other fiber out there where we see fiber poles and we say, hey, there's fiber right in front of here. But some of that is actually dark or dead or inaccessible. And, um, you know, some of that is also, as Bill said, it's uh, what we would call long haul fiber. It's not meant to be tapped. Uh, it's meant to go, you know, 80, 80 kilometers between facilities. It gets regenerated and then it shows up at one of your big data centers in Miami or Tampa or Jacksonville, Orlando, Tallahassee, uh, those things there. But there, it, it would certainly be interesting to be able to get onto some of that existing uh, fiber that was out there. Um, I don't know that there's currently uh, a way to do that today, but it seems like moving forward with M cores, there could be a very smart and ingenious way of doing it that would allow uh, rapid expansion of broadband. And if we could right. back into something on the existing stuff, that'd be really sweet too. Excellent, thank you. We have two hands still up and then we're gonna uh, wrap up the panel conversation from there because we do have um, some other agenda items to get to. Uh, Kent Wimmer is with the Defenders of Wildlife. He's had his hand up. Kent, what would you like to ask the panel? Hello, this is Kent Wimmer, Defenders of Wildlife. Um, I haven't heard any of you guys address emergency emergency emerging technology like 5G and and Elon Musk Starlink system. Wouldn't those systems make all this fiber obsolete in 15 or 20 years? So like like why are we bothering? Well, there's a question. How about it, Charlie? Well, I, again, I, I think I did mention uh, Elon Musk and the low orbiting satellite that will reduce the, the, the promise of that technology is that it will reduce the latency. You know, if you all remember the, the Max Headroom commercials in the 80s, uh, I mean, that's latency. So if we can reduce latency, 5G theoretically will reduce latency as well. I'm not sure 5G is, is a rural solution. It requires a lot of antennas to be put up. And in some uh, rural areas, that means you'd have to put up a bunch of poles in order to support the antennas. So again, I, I think all those new technologies as well as existing technologies are all part of the solution. Again, we're dealing with about 7% of Florida that we estimate doesn't have you know, read, readily available access to broadband. And it's, again, it's no, I wish I could say that my member companies have all the answers and they're the silver bullet. I don't think there is a silver bullet. I think it's gonna take all existing technologies and future technologies uh, for all this to work together. And again, I think if we get our act together, uh, not only with projects like MCORs and planning like this, but also starting to go after some federal money with a coordinated state plan, it's gonna take all that uh, to make it work. Excellent, good input. Yes, Dustin. You're on mute. Just backing up what Charlie said there, the first requirement for putting, for, for putting in a 5G system, which we are deploying in Hardy County, is the fiber. Because you gotta get massive capacity to the tower in order to get that out there. And then, um, we're gonna we're gonna let Elon enjoy his current success out there until we see his broadband success that exists um, from there. You know, physics is physics, and we have to see if Elon Musk can rewrite the physics of space transport. So, or at least in broadband concerns. Yes, Bill, do you have a quick follow up? I, I do. Um, as a society, we should have learned by now that we need redundancy in anything that we do. And, uh, you know, I would welcome every uh, mode of uh, transportation for Internet services, whether it be all six of them, all seven of them, uh, various ways. We just don't want to be dependent because our daily lives, telelearning, telemedicine, your doorbell now is tied to the Internet. Um, we, we, we need redundancy. Don't shun that, please. Excellent. All right, Charles, it looks like you have a follow-up question based on all the great input we've re received from the panel. Uh, what what follow-up question do you have for the panel? Well, it's, it's really more of a statement, and that's this. I mean, we've kind of danced around it for the last 20 minutes, but beginning with what Will said, it's very clear 
that waiting on 330 miles of MCORs to be constructed at a cost of 20 plus billion dollars is not necessary to put broadband in all of our rural communities in Florida. Uh, we have state road right of ways through most of those communities. We certainly would have county road right of ways through all of them. And simply by legislating a requirement that broadband be allowed within those right of ways, uh, rather than local governments perhaps being a little obstreperous with their willingness to allow things in their right of way. And then if we were to fund it, a uh, hundred or two hundred million dollars statewide, it looks to me like we could get this done for most of Florida's rural communities far faster than waiting on the very slow process of getting MCORs together. I mean, MCORs routes will have a place and they clearly will have uh, utility in this structure. But it seems to me like if we really wanted to get 5G into all of our rural communities quickly, we wouldn't be waiting on that slow plotting course, but rather we'd be looking at 100, 200 million dollars in the legislature with some statutory tag-ons to make it easier to use existing right-of-ways, and we'd be on with it. That's it. Thank you, Charles. All right, so uh, panelists, thank you so much, Brad, Dustin, Charlie, Bill. In this conversation, we've heard a lot about need, redundancy, innovation, reliability, the cost of things, the ability to make it scalable, and most importantly, partnership. So thank you for your partnership today in this conversation. We're gonna move on to uh, needs and guiding principles. We, You're welcome to listen in at the rest of this conversation because it's tied on to what we were just talking about as a panel. So thank you again for your service. All right, so thank you panelists for uh, task force members for your questions and the panelists for your time and expertise. Now we'd like to use the remaining time to tie this discussion back to the work of the task force. So Jennifer, I'm gonna hand it off to you to re briefly recap the high level needs, guiding principles and implementation. Thank you, Christine, and uh, message received on the briefly. I will uh, <laughs> try to make up some time here. So in task force meeting number three, we discussed broadband needs in the study area. And in this chart, we're showing the high level needs for broadband in the study area expressed by the percent population with no access to wired or fixed broadband, 25 megabits per second in rural and urban areas for each county. Generally, access to high-speed internet is lower in rural parts of the study area as compared to the urban areas. Federal Communications Commission, or FCC, data published in December 2018 shows an estimated 66.5% of Levy County's urban areas residents and 85.8% of Levy County's rural areas residents lack access to high-speed internet. The statewide averages for urban areas and rural areas are 1.7% and 22.1% respectively. The Florida Chamber Foundation's statewide connectivity goal is 100% access to high-speed internet by 2030 in order to sustain uh, continued growth and ensure Florida remains successful. Therefore, MCORs will address this need by expanding rural broadband infrastructure and access to broadband service. In previous task force meetings, we discussed the benefits of expanding broadband and connectivity in various sectors of the economy and in the society, including helping people with disabilities find jobs online and work from home. We also analyzed FCC data and mapped out internet providers and locations where they offer services. This information helps us to visually show unserved and underserved communities in the study area. We found that both fixed and mobile internet service providers are highly concentrated in urban areas. This is a heat map depicting areas with at least one service provider providing at least 200 kilobits per second per census block. These are areas with at least four service providers providing at least 200 kilobits per second in a census block. The heat maps show gaps in internet coverage across the study area and especially in rural areas. 
Many people, including in rural areas, have little or no access. Thus, there is a need to close the digital divide by increasing access to broadband to all residents in the study area. In task force meeting number three, the online modules, and in previous webinars, we have discussed guiding principles and implementation strategies related to broadband technology. Draft, God, draft broadband guiding principles are enhancing areas where utilities and broadband can be combined with a transportation facility through non-discriminatory, competitively neutral access to FDOT rights of way for utility and service providers or joint deployment of infrastructure. And implementation strategies are providing, excuse me, prioritizing additional infrastructure needs and funding sources needed to accommodate the corridor, local roads, rail, and utilities, including broadband. The guiding principles shown on the screen is not all encompassing, but just reflects what has been captured from previous discussions. Additional guiding principles that we may consider include enhanced connectivity to both local and regional roadway network, maintain consistency with utility master plans, maximize opportunities for partnerships with local agencies and private providers, leverage technology and innovation to ensure the most efficient, effective, and environmentally sensitive transportation corridor. Now I will hand it back to Christine. All right, thank you, Jennifer. So that sets the stage here. Um, we'd like to use the remaining time to tie this discussion back to the work of the task force. Um, and, and we've really focused on broadband today, but this is an example of where we began to really drill down on this larger conversation to align with the needs, the guiding principles, and um, how we may inform project development and beyond based on that with some draft instructions. So we've populated this slide with the topics that Jennifer just talked about. So that high level need to expand rural broadband infrastructure and has access to broadband, that draft guiding principle, and as Jennifer mentioned a moment ago, that this came out of ongoing conversation. So this is verbatim to what she shared. And then draft instructions for, for project development and uh, beyond. And we've heard a lot today um, from the panelists and questions that were brought up by you, the task force members. A need to refine these. What does this look like? Is there anything that we need to do to edit this along the way? So um, we can take a few comments as we're looking at the draft high-level needs, the guiding principles, and instructions as we are looking for about you know, five to ten minutes worth of conversation. Is there anything here uh, that task force members would like to add? And once again, we do have the hand raise opportunity for task force members. Um, if you are a member of the public, we're, we're going to ask that you provide that comment at the end of the meeting or provide it to the MCORS website. So Matt, would you like to add to this, uh, expand on this? Uh, sure, amendment? and I think, sure. I, well, I just think that we need to uh, look at policy uh, suggestions uh, whether it be legislative or however it may be, and maybe y'all can craft the language, uh, as was spoken to by one of our panelists that says that uh, there is obviously fiber out there that they don't have access to. Um, and how do we get that fiber and what are other states doing uh, for them to be able to have access to that? I have a last mile provider uh, that's here, um, but they don't have I don't know why they don't have access. It's AT and T. I mean, they're a big, big dog in the in the fight there, so they should have access to it. But there's other fiber that's around our state that maybe some of the smaller uh, providers, the smaller last mile providers, uh, won't have access to. And so, how do we get that? And what do we need to do to make sure that that doesn't happen? If you know this thing ends up going through, and we put 
all this fiber down the M cores, um, and then nobody has access to it, then we kind of defeated the whole purpose of this uh, process. All right, good input. Some some policy conversation. Charles, did you want to add to the conversation as well? Uh, yes, uh, in your middle bullet draft guiding principles, uh, you talk about access uh, to DOT rights of way. Uh, I would recommend that this draft guiding principle be expanded to include at least uh, DOT rights of way and county road rights of way. Uh, that would, would take some legislation, but I think that uh, getting a uh, robust uh, broadband network is going to require legislation. Uh, there needs to be the ability uh, for the purveyors of broadband to uh, access uh, county road rights of way as well. And I would add that this is not a problem exclusively to broadband. Uh, it's been encountered in a number of settings involving water and sewer, where uh, one of the impediments to putting in uh, sewer systems to eliminate septic tanks are what I would describe as bulky local governments who don't want to see their uh, road right of ways uh, utilized for uh, water and sewer lines. So there needs to be some general legislation at the state level uh, to uh, sort of pry these open and make them available. Excellent. That goes back to the reinforcement of the power of partnership that we often talk about. And when we can look at the long-term need and growth and, and vision and plans, the more we talk with one another, the more we can efficiently um, execute opportunities like this. How about any other draft high-level needs other than expanding rural broadband infrastructure and access? Are there other needs that are out there that we heard in our conversation today? Reliability, scalability, innovation. Well, this was the first um, drill down of kind of going through this exercise of looking at high level needs, guiding principles, and kind of implementation strategies. We're going to be going through this exercise more robustly across the board during our next webinar. So this introduces the process and we took a pretty deep dive on this today with extensive conversation and understanding across the board. So we appreciate your engagement as we've done that. Um, and we all remain available as you think through opportunities and when you come back to the next meeting that we have on June 25th that we're ready for a robust conversation. So thank you so much uh, for your engagement on this. And we really do appreciate the panelists and, and Will's deep dive in some of the information that was presented to us. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to you, Christina. All right. <clears throat> thank you, Christine, Jennifer, panelists, Will. Thank you, everyone. I'd like... Um, to recap a few of the next steps before we begin the public comment period. First, today's presentation and the webinar recording will be posted on the website. Second, we will continue to support the technical briefings with you regarding the online tool and the avoidance and attraction areas. Third, we have scheduled another webinar on June 25th to continue our, our work on high-level needs and guiding principles. And finally, we will be in touch as soon as we have a sense of the timing of future meetings. This concludes our formal presentation for today. We will now move on to the public comment period of our webinar. I want to continue to emphasize how important this input is to the process and that public comment during our meetings and webinars is only one way for the public to provide their input to us. Public comments may be submitted at any time to FDOT dot listens at dot state dot fl dot us 
and will become part of the public record. Let's now hear comments from members of the public who registered to speak and are on the webinar with us today. Christine, can you please introduce the public comment portion of this webinar? I'd be happy to. Thank you, Christina. All right, so now on to the public comment period. The public comment period is expected to take about an hour, and as always, we encourage everyone to stay engaged during this portion of the webinar. So as a reminder, requests to comment were received by five o'clock yesterday afternoon, and they will be addressed during the public comment period and the order that the request was made. If you do not respond when we, you call your name, we'll provide a second chance at the end of the public comment period. When your name is called to actually speak, we will unmute your line in order for you to provide comment within your allotted time of three minutes. You will hear a tone when you have 30 seconds remaining, and then another tone when your time is up. The line will be muted after three minutes, so please keep a close eye on the clock and listen to the tones. If you have more information to share with the group, you can provide additional comments in writing for further consideration. You can send those comments anytime to fdot.listens at dot.state.fl.us. So now, only one person at a time will be unmuted, and if you've self-muted, please be sure to unmute before you speak. So with that, I will call the first three uh, folks that have registered to speak. They are Lindsay Cross of St. Petersburg, Michael McGrath of Fort Myers, and Amy Datz of Tallahassee. Lindsay? Good morning. This is Go ahead. Good morning. This is Lindsay Cross with Florida Conservation Voters. Uh, today on round three of these webinars, we again asked DOT to put the brakes on this process. We are in the middle of a global health and economic pandemic. Our country is protesting for a much more just, equitable, and accountable future. And to barrel through with these one-sided webinars while the people of this state are suffering is callous, not to mention unconstitutional. Last week, DOT Secretary Kevin Tebow received a letter from the First Amendment Foundation formerly requesting that DOT halt the webinars. Based on provisions of Chapter 120.54, subparagraph 5 of Florida statutes, the MCORS task forces shall hold public meetings in accordance with Florida Chapter 286. This is the chapter that upholds Florida's government in the Sunshine Law. You yourself as DOT staff have admitted that the webinar technology has often not worked and that in-person meetings are preferable. And despite these being called webinars, they are still listed on the MCORS website and task force members are requested to participate, making them a form of task force meeting. Technical problems have prevented interested persons from attending which should have resulted in a termination of these proceedings. Instead, you have insisted on moving forward with even more scheduling six meetings this month. The current structure of the webinars continues to shortchange the public and doesn't allow for open dialogue between task force members and the public on the true need and justification for these roads. Quite frankly, discussions about broadband and technology, which can be accomplished without a toll road are a diversion. There is still no evidence that these roads are needed, nor that they are financially viable. I applaud the First Amendment Foundation for sharing the letter with DOT staff and all of the task force members. As our state and nation grapple with how to protect freedom of speech, one of our most basic rights as Americans, we ask that you halt these webinars and any further discussion with the task force members until the process is fully accessible and in the sunshine. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cross. Up next is Michael McGrath. Hello, good morning, folks. My name is Mike McGrath. I'm an organizer for Sierra Club based out of Fort Myers, Florida. Um, holding rural communities hostage by forcing them to choose between broadband connectivity and a highway that runs straight through their backyard is wrong and disingenuous. 
those who use this false narrative to promote MCORs are simply lying to the public. Rural communities do not have to make that choice. Here is the truth. There are, there are alternatives that are both cheaper, less environmentally damaging, and can accomplish the same connectivity goals much, much sooner than building these toll roads. The communities that are currently without broadband access simply do not need to wait for these new roads to be completed to get connectivity. These toll roads are not necessary and cost are not necessary cost of bringing broadband to underserved communities. Aerial broadband, for example, is one of the many well-documented services that can be done independently of road construction and for a fraction of the cost. We need real solutions and we need them now. Exit now. Don't build the road. Bring high-speed broadband independently instead. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McGrath. Up next is Amy Datz. Muted. Unmuted. Amy Datz, you are unmuted. Hi. Okay, hi. Uh, my name is Amy Datz. I have been an environmental science, professional environmental scientist for over 40 years. Uh, this panel has identified that 22% of Floridians, or over 700,000 Floridians in the region of this project, have no or poor internet connectivity. This area of deficiency covers 43% of Florida counties. This connectivity will not only improve their quality of life, but reduce air quality pollution because they can use telemedicine, telecommuting, and online education. And getting to an emergency room by car can take many precious minutes. Getting to a doctor by telemedicine can save lives. The citizens of this area are being left out of our current work program at home during this pandemic, putting their health in further jeopardy and keeping them in high child poverty and unemployment. We know that the children in these areas are falling behind the students who do have internet access to their teachers and educational materials. Because of this extended broadband area, the opportunities to reduce trips and therefore air pollution and congestion from this area are limitless. This will also allow us to monitor wildlife movement through wildlife crossing. Money talks. There are other ways to get broadband, but those funding sources have not been identified or allocated from Florida's state budget. In this case of the in the case of this project, money does and will provide the citizens in this area to talk. The opponents of this project are saying that they are happy with their internet connectivity and they use their internet to oppose this project. But the 22% of Floridians that would benefit from this project, to them they say, let them eat cake. I, uh, I feel strongly that we need to give these people a voice. I know that uh, some clubs have uh, gotten a petition up to um, talk about, uh, to, to oppose this project, but all of the 700,000 people who don't have internet have not been able to, been given the voice to participate in say, hey, we want this. We want to have internet. We want to be like everyone else and, and have telemedicine and, and learn at home. You're robbing these people of what you have, and that's not fair. Thank you very much and be well and be safe in this pandemic. Thank you, Ms. Dads. Up next is Ludmilla Fuentes. Ludmilla, you are unmuted. Ludmilla Fuentes, you are up next and you are unmuted. Okay, we'll circle back. Up next is Mabel Patterson. Mabel, you are unmuted. Uh, thank you. This is Mabel Patterson who lives in Riverview, Florida. And I do not live in the study area, but I have traveled extensively throughout North Central Florida, um, all the way from Tampa up to the Georgia border, along the Suncoast pathway, and across the state um, 
through parts of the area that are affected by the Northern Corridor. I've attended almost every meeting in person and online, and I still began every meeting by looking at the MCORS goals that were given at our first meeting in August in Tampa. And I still have not seen any of those goals that would be not done better without the roads, more cost effective without the roads, more reasonable without the roads, less destructive without the roads. The roads are not necessary. From this most recent uh, meeting, what I've taken is that even if we spend $23 billion to build roads, we can't guarantee that those people in that last mile will have better internet access, that they will not have, that they will have better broadband access. We can't guarantee that they will have better jobs. Basically, you are saying that we're going to build the roads and then maybe they could have it. They have the money. They have uh, uh, local utilities that will provide them. But you can't say that that's going to happen. It's, it's ridiculous, really. Uh, you're asking the state, the taxpayers in the state, and I am one of those. You're asking the people who live in these areas to give up everything to put our money and our time and our lives into building these roads that serve very few of the people affected by them. Uh, I don't see how you're going to connect rural communities by cutting them off from one another with a toll road. I don't see how you're going to provide broadband when you're going to put in big corridors but not provide local access. I don't see how you're going to provide jobs to people whose jobs depend on the natural resources of their area when you're destroying those natural resources. What I'd like to say finally is that I appreciate the task force and I appreciate their comments and I hope that they will recommend no build as the only reasonable option for this, these toll roads. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Patterson. Up next is Eugene Kelly. Eugene, you are unmuted. Hello, good morning. Uh, Eugene Kelly, representing the Florida Native Plant Society. I have commented uh, at nearly every meeting of the task force. I have also submitted comments as an individual uh, through comment cards submitted at those task force meetings, uh, through emails to FDOT listens. I haven't attended any of the community open houses. I know that's been another venue for the public to comment on, on MCORs. My, I, I have to admit I've had a discomfort commenting in any way other than directly to the task, task force members. Uh, from my mouth to their ears. Uh, I, I feel it's the only way to know that the actual influencers and DOT staff are, are able to hear what I, I have to say, my concerns and the information that I wanna share, which I, I hope can be a constructive part of the process. But I have to say uh, nearly a year into the process, the initial inaugural task force meeting was in August at the beginning of Today's proceedings, I believe I heard that public comments submitted through all those other uh, avenues will somehow be uh, provided to the task force members in July. That's nearly a year in. And I felt then and I feel now that those comments are just going into some kind of virtual black hole. And now I, I'm not really not comfortable with commenting in this format. I don't mean to imply there's any nefarious attention by DOT or uh, anyone else. I know we need to get business and government back on track, moving to the extent we can do so safely. And I, I believe these virtual meetings are a good faith attempt to do that. And they, uh, they may have some value in that, but they are not the proper uh, way 
to receive public comment. I don't know if there are any task force members out there listening to me. I feel that I may as well just be submitting my comments into that virtual black hole at, at FDOT listens. Hopefully I won't feel that way uh, about the public comment that's been submitted after I hear what you do in July. I will say that I don't intend to comment during any more of these virtual meetings unless the process is modified to provide some comfort level uh, that my comments are actually being heard by the members of the task force. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Up next is Herman Younger. Herman, you are unmuted. Hello? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, my name, my name is Herman Younger. I'm an organizing representative for the Sierra Club based in Gainesville, Florida. Last week, the First Amendment Foundation addressed the Florida Department of Transportation's failure to follow the law during the April and May MCORS webinars. Florida Administrative Code Rule 28-109.004 specifically applies the Sunshine Law to all meetings conducted by state agencies. The rule states that, quote, if during the course of a CMT proceeding, technical problems develop with the communications network that prevent interested persons from attending, the agency shall terminate the proceeding until the problems have been corrected, end quote. Since April, FDOT has already completed at least six MCORS task force webinars with various technical and communication errors. Rather than terminating the meetings immediately as required by law, FDOT continued to conduct the webinars, therefore violating Florida's Sunshine Law. If FDOT cannot provide access to, quote, all interested persons, end quote, it cannot proceed further without violating Florida law. Stop the illegal webinars. Stop the rush to rubber stamp M course. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Younger. Up next is Marlene Weiss. Marlene, you're unmuted. You're self muted. Hello. Yes, I'm here. Thank you so much for this opportunity to describe how the FDOT projects in my area have affected residents. I understand that this is not your focus area, but I just wanted to stimulate a little broader awareness of some of the issues that have you still hear me? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Hello? Okay, I'm sorry. Um, I'm a 20 year And I've seen the effects of the so-called improvements of I-95 and US-1. There's been a clear cutting and decimation of natural systems that have created runoff, standing water, and flooding, you know, at, at rainy times. You can see this at our Vieira Regional Park at 95. The park has deafening traffic noise. There's dead turtles on I-95 and the surrounding roads. There's uh, turtles that can be seen that are trying to cross the road that are creating Um, uh, kids that used to be able to use their electric vehicles to get around, it's just not safe for them with the high traffic areas, the way the roads have been constructed. Um, the natural and agricultural integrity is ultimately compromised, and I think that it's the taxpayers and the residents who will have to pay to mitigate for the problems that are created by making these uh, roadways. The US-1 widening created a more speeding, more noise, and um, it was unsafe, the signage, when it was being put in. Um, there was two-way traffic, you know, routing that was super unsafe. And once built, the noise and pedestrian safety worsened. My concern is for the health of people, young people, all the residents of Florida. We need safe food. We need places to walk and bike more than we need broadband. People, young people, they have phones. They have um, some internet access, but they're getting their uh, the limits to their ability to have safe places in, in my area. Um, it has gone out of balance where they are not, no longer have safe places to walk and enjoy the clean air and the local food. So the cost to residents to subsidize uh, broadband business and developers' interests, it's just too great. I just ask you to be cognizant 
of the people, the plants, the wildlife, the watershed, the natural systems that are in your area before you, you know, start putting in systems that interfere with the what's already there. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Weiss, for your comment. Up next is Sandy Beach. Sandy, you are unmuted. You are self-muted. Sandy Beach, you are unmuted and self-muted. Okay, we'll circle back. Up next is David Biddle. David, you are self-muted. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir, go ahead. Yeah, hi, I'm David Biddle, live in Trenton, um, Trenton, Florida, Gilchrist County. I'm um, gonna be pretty close or possibly in where the uh, road is coming through, possibly coming through. And um, a couple things I wanted to say is, uh, is first, there's a lot of First Amendment concerns. A lot of people are saying, um, these webinars have actually expanded our ability to take part in the process. Um, me as a working person, I can't take off and drive to these different locations to talk. Um, but this has made it available to where more people can be involved in the process. And I thank you for continuing to find a way to, to involve the public with that. Um, also, Gilchrist County, you know, I've said it, I've said it before, that is we're an economic desert. We don't have a lot of opportunity. Um, these roads could bring opportunity to our area. Um, we also have very limited internet access and this broadband will be a huge plus for us will be a huge way that we can attract some kind of economic development into our area. So I'm thankful that, that that's going to be part of it as well. Um, and just uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Biddle. Up next is Christopher McDermott. Okay, can you, uh, I'm going to go now. Yes. Chris McDermott, St. Augustine, uh, living here since 2004. I have enjoyed uh, uh, much of rural Florida, investigating in our RV, rivers, streams, uh, around Ocala, taking a master naturalist class, and learning as much as I can about this wonderful state. Florida's economy right now is taking a major hit from COVID-19 pandemic. Tourism and travel are down, state revenues are decimated. Where will these budget cuts occur? The first cut should be the 45 million in this year's budget for the proposed toll roads and 90 million next year. And overall 2.1 billion in investment, I'm sorry, 21 billion in investment to build these three roads. What do we get for these toll roads? The answer is we get very little, but those that build them make a whole bunch of money, most of it going to out-of-state construction and concessionaires. Little hard evidence shows that MCORS was a priority before the pandemic, and it would never add to economic growth or rural jobs as much as it subtracts from agricultural output and from local owned businesses, which would be bypassed by this stream of concrete and paving. It won't stem the flow of declining flow of our rivers, restore springs and aquifers, or enhance wildlife corridors. It will worsen them. Large impermeable roads increase pollution, fragment wildlife corridors, and contribute to planet warming. MCORS is the budget-busting proposal from the past. It's Florida 50 years ago. It's not the Florida of tomorrow. Where is the vision? MCORS represents a future of tourism, that envisions them driving their gas guzzling cars down here, bypassing most of the state to get to the key tourist areas in the South. Those key tourist areas, Orlando, Miami, Tampa, and other newer areas are already congested, suffering from highways that are 
outdated and under maintained. One speaker already mentioned the fact that we don't have wildlife bridges. I've been in states, I've been in countries where I worked for 30 years as a policy advisor and seen even in Singapore, they build wildlife bridges across so that the animals can safely navigate across these major highways. Building a highway now, a super tollway, is like Blockbuster Video announcing in 2007, it was going to double its 9,000 stores to meet the needs of a growing population. The future is improved use of our existing travel quarters, not letting them decline and shifting resources to, toll, to new toll roads. Go ahead and build a broadband, but invest in roads and highways that have wildlife bridges and better drainage. Choose the future that positions us for the good things to come. Thank you, Mr. McDermott. Next up, Lumilda Fuentes. Lumilda, you are unmuted. Lumilda Fuentes, you are unmuted. Last call for Lumilda Fuentes. Moving on. Next up, Sandy Beach. I'll, get, I'll catch you in a minute. Sandy, you are unmuted. Okay. Sandy Beach, you are unmuted. Um, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Oh, okay. All right, great. Um, I was having a little technical difficulties earlier. Um, I just want to say that I am I support this um, toll road, and uh, one of the reasons is that we need more jobs in Florida. Our unemployment numbers reach fifteen percent, and this project will create thousands of jobs. As every one billion in federal highway and transit investment funded by the American Jobs Act would support 13,000 jobs for one year. We're talking about even more than that, but that's, it's significant. Um, and I would like to see us move forward with this project. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Beach. Thank you. That ends our public comment period. We'd like to thank you for joining our webinar.